In our first story, Finance Minister Keno Furiata was in Parliament on Thursday to present the mid-year budget review, announcing there will be no increment in the value-added tax rate. Contrary to speculations, government wanted to increase VAT and the National Health Insurance Levy. The minister said government has no such plans. Instead, he said the GET Fund and NHI levy component of the tax will now be charged separately. Beyond this, Mr. Speaker, any taxes should be to elicit socially desirable outcomes such as a better environment in this regard. I would like to inform the House, Mr. Speaker, that there will be no increase in VAT. We'll come to the other tax measures announced by the finance minister. Before then, though, what does the finance minister mean by the GET Fund and NHIL being charged separately? Deputy Finance Minister Kweku Kwating concedes consumers should expect to pay higher taxes. Deputy Minority Leader James Aveji, however, insists government is increasing VAT through the back door. That would mean that a consumer would pay a little more than they have traditionally paid. But as I indicated again, we have weighed that option against that's, that's the option of also a straightforward bat, okay. and we have come to the conclusion that this is friendlier to the consumer, and that is why we have put it across. I'm, we are we are we are upfront about that, yeah, and I'm, I'm happy about the answer because it is increasing the value through a back door. Simple. That's an explanation. The consumer pay more. If you increase the VAT by 1%, the consumer pays more. If you now apply the 2.5% on the transaction and not the value added, he pays more. So the consumer, at the end, is the one who loses. For that matter, it's increasing VAT through a back door. I'm happy about the answer. But what do you say? Is that but, 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 to pay for coal? No, it is a strategy of implementing a tax measure so that it has minimal impact. And I recognize, I recognize. What do you I can tell you that, I can tell you that the impact is more than even increasing the VAT by 1%. I can tell you. Look, we have... We'll be talking a lot more about that, but the finance minister also announced there will be new taxes on the importation of luxury vehicles. Mr. Speaker, VAT will thus be maintained at 12.5%. Mr. Speaker, we are imposing a luxury, we are imposing a luxury vehicle tax with capacity of three liters and above. Mr. Speaker, we are reviewing personal income tax to include an additional ban of 10,000 CDs and above per month at a rate of 35%. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we are intensifying the compliance. Mr. Foriata told the House the city is performing better under the watch of the MPP than it had over the last six years. Despite the strong fundamentals, we have seen the CD come under pressure, primarily due to external pressures. In fact, aside, Mr. Speaker, in fact, Mr. Speaker, aside from the short transitory volatilities recorded in June this year, the average performance of the dollar has been one of the best in recent years. Mr. Speaker, the performance of the Ghana city during the 18 months of the Akufuado government has been impressive. If compared with the last six years, these are the facts. The year-on-year -year depreciation of the Ghana city against the U.S. dollar stood at 4.9% in 2017. It was 9.7% in 2016. It was 15.7% in 2015. 
it was 31.3% in 2014 and 17.5% in 2015. A further interrogation, Mr. Speaker, of the data from Bank of Ghana showed that the depreciation of the first half, six months of 2018, has been the best since 2012. It is instructive to note, Mr. Speaker, that from January 2018 to June 2018, the accumulated depreciation of Ghana City against the dollar was 22.4 percent. That's again 17.2 percent in 2012. There was, however, some good news for prospective homeowners as they can now use part of the pension contribution to secure a mortgage. In line of this social partnership and the National Mortgage and Housing Finance Scheme announced in the 2018 budget and economic policy for August, for this August House, the government has designed a scheme to provide cheaper local currency mortgages and residential housing finance to promote social equity. Mr. Speaker, we have observed that to effectively support housing delivery we must address both the demand and supply side of the housing market and develop a scheme that creates an effective ecosystem for home buyers, developers, and financial institutions. On the demand side, government is working with selected banks to provide local currency mortgages at 10% per annum compared to the current market rates of over 25%. Workers will be encouraged to use their tier two pension contributions as equity in the event of income earners who can still not afford a mortgage at a competitive rate. Joining me in the studio right now is uh, Dr. Gideon Bwako, he's a spokesperson for the Vice President, and he's going to throw more light on some of the issues that the uh, Finance Minister has uh, raised in his mid-year budget review. Thank you for making time, uh, Dr. Bwako. Now, the, the first one that interests me and lots of people is the fact that, um, as stated by the minority, Deputy Minority Leader, government found, even though the VAT increase uh, that was speculated didn't happen. Government found a very creative and clever way of bringing in VAT or an increase in VAT through the back door. How do you respond to that? Thank you very much, Israel, and good evening to our viewers. Yes, it is true that contrary to the speculations and then the issues the minority raised, Ghanaians did not see an increase in their VAT. And but it is also that, true that they will pay more. Um, I'm not too sure of that. What government has done is to move away from the usual way of taxing, whereby the poor are taxed the more, like taxes on catalysis and those kind of things, and then find innovative ways to tax such that you can bridge the social the gap between the rich and then the poor. So if you look at most of the tax policies, they are targeted at those that God has blessed and they have something, and they can also help in the redistribution right. of wealth. This so NHIL and Get Fund uh, levy, how does it not affect the poor? Um, to some extent, this one may have a dual effect, may affect the poor somehow and affect also the rich. But what we have done is that, you know, when VAT came, the NHIL component of 2.5% and the VAT component of 2.5% were supposed to be sales tax. But in the treatment of the VAT, they have not been treated as sales tax in the past. And so we have a situation where the producers charge both the input and then the output. And then they pay 2.5, which is the ad output to government. And then they keep the 2.5, which is the input part. So what government has done is to ensure proper treatment of that tax description such that the 2.5 percent that used to go to the business guys will not go to them anymore. It becomes revenue to government, but it does not impose additional responsibility on the consumers. And so in actual sense, if you go to the market today or restaurant to buy food, the actual VAT they're going to charge on you, that is the VAT that the person, the supplier or the person who owns the restaurant is going to charge and take is the 12.5. Okay, then the 2.5, 2.5 that to be charged is something that goes to government. That's not go 
to, to right. that. So let's get this clear. You go to a restaurant that uh, you buy a meal that's uh, 20 CDs. How is this going to be applied? 12.5 VAT it's and then on it. it's charged on it. Yeah. And then 2.5. Is the 2.5 going to be charged on the meal plus the VAT price? No, it's not the, going the to price be. Price the price plus the VAT. It's not Please going to be the composite it. of that. Okay. It's not going to be the composite of that. So it's, if I understand it well, the task people have been explaining, it's going to be charged on the actual cost without that 12.5%. And then when they are going to, they go to GRA, instead of taking 2.5 and paying government 2.5, the 2.5 that goes to the restaurant owner will no longer go to the person, but rather goes to government. So it's an additional a way of bringing in revenue to government. No, which one are you talking about? Because I'm, I'm also, apart from the VAT, which is 12.5 right now, there's also NHIL 2.5 yeah, exactly. and get fund of 2.5. 2 .5. I'm, yeah. I'm trying to understand how this reflects on an invoice. Yeah, that's why I'm saying that um, we can take... So we can f let's forget about the, um, the restaurant operator, for yeah. instance. Let's talk about the consumer yeah. who gets an invoice. What is the consumer going to see on that invoice? So usually when you go to the restaurant and then they give you the bill, the actual cost is there, the quantity and the unit price, the actual cost is there. And then they say the VAT, T. maybe 17.5%. Then you pay that on top of that. Right. This time around, it's going to be 12.5%. Right, so let's use 100 CDs. Okay. So 100 CDs. I don't want to use specific figures <laughs> for now. 100 CDs, okay. but 12.5. You charge the 12.5 on that one. On the 100 CDs. And then the 2.5 VAT and then the 2.5 NHL is also charged, not on the total sum of the 12.5 and the actual cost, but charged on the actual cost. On the 100 CDs. Exactly. And then that one goes to government. But at the end of the day, it still comes to 17.5% as a total. So government gets nothing more because you're indicating they're expecting to get more. Government does. You see, in the, in, the, in the treatment, government gets what it, he will get. The only thing that has changed here is the fact that 2.5 will not go to the owner anymore. All right. Now, one other bit has to do with the income, ta income tax bracket from yeah. 10,000 cities and yeah. above. How is it, again, how is that going to be applied? Are we to expect 35% uh, on, for instance, if you earn 10,000, are we expecting 35% on the entire 10,000? Or they're going to graduate the 10,000 before? So yeah, I think you know accounting more than me. <laughs> so the moment no. you talk about graduated tax rates, I mean, you understand it. So what is going to happen? It also goes with some convoluted comp competitions. And I just did some small calculation here. What is happening is that if your um, income is around within two cities, one Ghana cities, that one is free. So that is the first one. Yeah. The next one is in the additional 70, you pay 5%, 100 cities, you pay 10%, 2,810, you pay 17.5%, 6,759, you pay 25%, and a city 10,000, you pay 35%. Yeah. So what happens is that if you go to the restaurant, for instance, and you buy an item that costs thousand cities, uh, let's say you are no, we are talking about income. We're if you're a government about. worker that receives thousand Ghana cities, maybe Senate takes it five point five percent, which is zero point five five. You multiply by thousand, that is fifty five. Then you subtract the fifty five from the thousand, you get nine four five. Nine four five then becomes your taxable income. Okay. Now that taxable income, the first two hundred and sixty one component of it is free. Okay, good. So you subtract that one from that and then you get a certain figure and then the figure that you get then you go and match it from the graduated tax rates and then you take the first 70 which falls within you subtract five percent which is 3.5 the next 100 10 percent so you do that once you do that and come and subtract what you get from the 30 and the 100 from it what you're going to get is 514 and the 514 is the component that you have gotten from the 700 which is 3.5 plus 10 then you check within the 2810, which is 17.5. You charge that on it, and then you come to somewhere around 103.45. And the same goes for the rest and the rest and the rest. Okay. So the computation. So, in effect, what, what I just want to be so sure the, of like, is that if those if who you, earn more, if you earn 10,000 and above, you're not going to pay 3,500 CDs as tax. Not in literal terms like that. The competition will arrive at a certain It won't be figure. 35%, that's what I mean. Uh, I, 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 it I won't be 35% of 10,000. Yeah, after the computation, it is likely to be lower than that. 
right. but it goes to this kind of co competition. How much, how much revenue is government hoping to raise from all of these uh, tax measures that you've introduced? I think if my memory serves me right, um, I've forgotten there's that figure the finance minister put up, but we have a revenue gap of about one point something billion. That is a gap we've had for up to general up to now, and that is why we seek to close. But the tax measures we are putting up will be able to generate revenue that exceeds that. So we are hoping that how much we hope to generate from there, so we'll be able to exceed the kind of gap that we have, and then we can maintain our deficit at 4.5 percent as we have already projected so that we don't exceed our deficit target to bring credibility issues between us and the IMF and then also in our general economic management stream. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gideon Bwako. Dr. Gideon Bwako is uh, an advisor to the vice, a spokesperson for the vice president. In a related development, Joe News' Nancy M. Fajadozi reports that spare parts dealers at the Botukai market are not impressed with all that the finance minister has had to say currently um, at the spare parts at Aboso Okai to speak to some of these particular spare part dealers because they have been complaining that they are not feeling anything in their budget. We just want to find out from them whether they are even paying attention anyways to um, the speech or the review being delivered by the finance minister. I've been gathered or you know, joined by um, one of the dealers. First of all, I'm Finance Minister, no, or kind media review. I don't know who you're interested. Ah, uh, you're interested because you you're not for so be a every year, or more year, am I so? Every say, say you're not be be for so be every so. And Kaya and Kaza, no, you're best for a radio. But at now, me no Kaza, you be answer. I am not interested in any budget review by any government because it doesn't benefit us in any way. That is why our radios are off. Duties are so high, and we are just making losses. The president has told everyone they've reduced taxes for spare parts dealers. But that's untrue. So we are not happy. Instead of us receiving the promise that the uh, government made before it was the government was elected into power, uh, one district, one factory. We are rather experiencing one junction, one but the sanitation is very bad here. It's very, 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 very bad. And we don't want to listen to the government saying anything because it's talking government. You can't discriminate between holiday and a working day here. You can't tell. Every day is the same, it's equal. As a marketplace, there should be a day with the place is gingering, going up and down, things are working. Then when there is holiday, you, you experience less people coming here because it's an holiday and nothing is, should, uh, people should relax. But now you can't tell holiday and a normal day. We sit down, we don't do anything. And all that we, we keep saying is, hmm, 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 like, as if something has happened. But we don't know what is happening here. Duty is very high. Things are not going on well with us at all. And what they rather do is bring in taxes and taxes, taxes. If the person doesn't get money, how can the person pay taxes? And they sit there up there and they enjoy. The things that they enjoy there, the, the common Ghanaian is not enjoying it. They, and all is from our monies, it's from our taxes. Things that we've been buying them some, some few years back, 80 cities, now we are buying it 170, 180. So I've left one corner where they were not listening to the budget and I have spotted another shop um, where they are listening to uh, the budget review by the finance minister. I've been, I've been joined by them. Let me just find out uh, from them what they were able to pick from this. Mbacho, so what's your budget? I'm not busy, I'm not okay. busy. But this is the situation where I'm going to be. And I'm going to be here and I'm going to be here and I'm going to be here and I'm going to be here. Well, I couldn't listen with rapt attention. The budget is just the same since the days of old. We just want a better standard of living. We are really suffering. He should stop saying the prices are going down because it's untrue. This government is cunning. Whenever it says it has reduced prices, then it's the other way around. No, maintain we are amamenyaje. 
Say how many about here? I need money. May you go high. We say 20 feet. Last year, it was 85 million. 120 million old currency in it. But Nanado always going saying that what in your mouth? What money? Any no credit? Any no. Watching Joy News, Prime, we're taking a break, but still ahead in the bulletin, police military team intervene to restore relative calm to Kumasi server where angry youth went on rampage over the killing of seven members of the community. I can watch my head, I swear by Almighty Allah, that that guy is not a thief, he's not a robber. All right, when we come back, we bring you more analysis on the budget, media budget review by, presented by the finance minister with Emmanuel Abuaji Riafi. That's coming up in business when we come back. Thank you very much for staying on business. Let's take a look at some more reactions in the aftermath of the mid-year budget presentation. And the Ghana Chamber of Commerce and Industry has been reacting to some highlights of the mid-year review. CEO of the Chamber, Mark Bedouabwaji, lauded the decision by government to maintain the VAT rate at 12%, saying it is a relief for the private sector. He was also of the view that government must, however, go in for the long-term solutions to arrest the city's depreciation. The high point was the fact that taxes were not uh, increased because already we are suffering from a very high um, cost of doing business and we were all praying for that although there were some speculations that taxes were going to be increased which we actually expressed our displeasure about it but the minister had actually confirmed that there are no increase in VAT and there are no increase in other taxes so we are happy about that. Okay, so that assurance has been cleared for you, that doubt has been cleared. But one of the main concerns faced private sector has also been the issue about the city, the depreciation of the city therein. The, fin the finance minister has described it as a marginal depreciation. He's saying that efforts are being made to shore it up. Are you convinced as you know, an, an entire entity? Uh, for me, uh, marginal in terms of uh, from the business sector will not be that marginal because every point one percent depreciation of, of the city it's very huge for um, a business person that is rather either important or exporting. Or if you've gone for a loan and the city had depreciated by even 0 0.1, it's not much now. It's a huge sum of money. Um, and uh, um, the suggestion that is from the center factor is something that I don't really buy totally into it. We've not built the capacity of the private sector to be able to produce to support the city. For how long are we going to suffer from these uh, 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 sectors? Because they always come about, how do we position ourselves as a country to be sure that the city is strong enough so that if these external pressures come along, we have a strong city that can also withstand this uh, uh, pressure. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, I think over, over the years, we've used short-term measures to stabilize this currency, and it's not, it's not helping us. Every year when it comes, either it's a syndicated loan that we are using, or is a um, euro bond that we are going for to support the city, or we are drawing down on our, our reserve. And for a short term, I think it's about time to look at for for the long term. How do we make the city strong against the major trading currencies? Mm -hmm. And that will require that we have to support businesses. The city depreciation is a matter of demand and supply. Mm -hmm. But what about the issues of tax compliance? Having to you know uh, widen the tax net and getting to ensure that everyone is on board to pay their taxes. He made mention about tax compliance, taxes to elicit social you know uh, uh, interventions and whatnot. What's your take on it as a chamber? Yeah, I think it's, it's very key. He clearly stated the shortfall in revenue for the first six months. And it's all because we've not been able to uh, collect the taxes as efficient as it is. We don't believe in uh, constantly increasing taxes. We believe in widening the tax net. Meanwhile, economist with Data Bank Courage Marty has been assessing the decision by government to maintain the VAT rate at 12.5%. The finance minister also restructured the national health insurance levy and the get fund levy as trade tax. Karish Mati, who was sharing his thoughts on business life early this evening, supported the move by government, saying it was the best option under the current conditions. Well, I, I saw a fiscal framework that was on the knife's edge, mm. so that if we didn't do these adjustments, 
we would very likely miss our targets. Mm. And the implication of that is that it would have been difficult to sustain investor confidence because remember that we would have exited the IMF program next year. Okay. And so if you miss your target upon exiting the IMF program, mm. which should have made you achieve your target, mm. and you were missing it at the end, then investors would be very apprehensive about what the outlook holds. Mm. And so it was necessary for these adjustments to be done mm. in order to keep the framework on track for us to meet our targets at the end of the program. I think um, I, I would say the government did very well in trying to minimize the impact of the tax measures. Mm. And if you look at the way they, they, they spread the tax burden, mm. they try to impose a lot more of the burden at the higher end of the income ladder mm -hmm. than on the lower end. Mm -hmm. I think where most of the uh, lower end of the income ladder will fill it is where the, the NHIL, the health insurance levy, mm -hmm. and the get fund levy have been decoupled for, from value added tax mm -hmm. and will not be applied as a strict, strict Yes, levy. I was coming to that. I want us to narrow on these three. First of all, before we came on, I was trying to get the meaning of straight levy. What's the difference between VAT and straight levy? I think basically what they are trying to say, because it's not a common term in, in, in the economics or Have you come tax, across it before? I, I haven't. I, I must admit I'm hearing it for the first time. Okay. So, But if you try to understand where we are coming from mm. and what they are trying to do, at the time we had the health insurance levy of 2.5 and the get fund levy of 2.5, mm. we had it under the value added tax system. Okay. In that particular situation, this levies would be applied on value added. added to yeah okay now if you take them out of the value added components mm. then what it means is that you have you are going to apply them on a bigger base okay in order to rake in more revenue mm. And so on the media review, Finance Minister Kendo Furiata says the value of crude oil exported for the first half of the year amounted to $1,908.22 million as compared with $1,033.35 million recorded in the same period in 2017. As part of the mid-year review, Kendo Furiata noted the increase in value of oil exports which contributed significantly to revenue was a result of effects of crude oil prices on the world market. Total realized inflows from petroleum receipts amounted to 2.1 billion, 36.3 percent higher than the program estimate of 1.5 billion. This includes corporate income tax arrears from oil of about 373.5 million for the period. Mr. Speaker, the shortfall in non-oil tax revenue is mainly as a result of lower than anticipated reported MDS retention from non tax receipts. It is important, however, to note that the modest inflow from the yield from NDS IDF capping of about 5.6 million or 7.2 percent of the program target of the Ghana 77.7 .7 million was realized for that period. Mr. Speaker, total government expenditure, including arrears clearance, amounted to 23.8 billion, 9.8% of GDP, and constitutes 38.3% of the annual budget target. Although the outturn was 3.2% lower than the program target of 24.6 billion, moderate slippages were observed in the wage bill, 279.6 million, and goods and services, 134.1 million. And away from the mid-year, now former President John Ejikum Kufo has justified the decision to sell part of Ghana Telecom, now Vodafone Ghana, to a private company during his tenure as president. Speaking at the Vodafone 10th anniversary dinner, he said the decision was a step in the right direction considering the company's increased offerings in recent times. Ismak Awusa's report has more. Ladies and gentlemen, today is a, is a defining moment in the life of our company as we mark another phase in our quest to ignite Ghana's digital agenda. In the year 2008, government under the leadership of former President John Ajikum Kufo sold 70% of Ghana Telecom for $900 million to Vodafone, a situation that sparked some agitations from a section of the public. In what sounds like an assessment of post-privatization performance of the company, Mr. Kufour says the decision he took has transformed the company to what it is today. There was a lot of criticism 
when others decided to give, uh, if you like, the concession to Kodafu. Thankfully, within the past 10 years, I believe uh, the step we took has been vindicated with such a panache that now as I sit here, I feel a bit like a, a, a seer, a prophet. The former president also urged Vodafone Ghana to list on the Ghana Stock Exchange. Let me use this occasion to commend Vodafone for a great job done in your first decade in Ghana. I say well done. Unfortunately for you though, you have set such a high standard that you dare not depart from. Permit me to suggest that the board and management resolve to offload some of your equity stake in the company to the Ghana Stock Exchange to promote your local context. The former president was sharing his thoughts at the 10th anniversary dinner of Vodafone here in Accra. Yolanda Kuba is chief executive of the telecommunication company. This is the new age. This is the digital age. It is uncertain in many forms and has many social and economic implications for all of us. The good news is that for Ghana, you don't have to worry. For us, for an African country like ours, which is determined with the kind of leadership that we have today, we are confident that with Vodafone and the leadership that we have today in this country, we will be able to leapfrog and be with the forerunners in everything that they are doing in the digital age. Vice President of Ghana, who was guest speaker at the launch, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia reiterated government's quest to consider payment of salaries via mobile money. The Vodafone 10th anniversary dinner was on a theme, a decade of connections, future of limitless possibilities. Bismarck Ausa, Joy Business. And that's all in business tonight. Many thanks for watching. My name is Imanu Abwaji. We are here this morning is ahead. Good evening. Uh, relative calm has returned to the Kumasi suburb of Wasawasi in the Ashanti region where some Zongo youth clashed with police. It took the intervention of a reinforced police military team to calm angry youth who burned tires, blocked roads and pelted stones at the police detailed to the area over the gunning down of seven persons from the community. The police says were suspected armed robbers who opened fire on them. It took the swift intervention of some mechanics and residents to also stop attempts to burn the Aswasi police station. We can now hear from one of the leaders in the community, Al Haji Shuabu uh, Musa Sharif, as the General Secretary of the National Association of Zongo Chiefs. The Constitution has given the mandate what and what to do. Have you followed that procedure? We haven't done that. Now, who is going to protect you when you're going to follow the procedure? And then whom are you going to demonstrate against you? They're going to demonstrate against the police, and the people are going to give you the most. And it's the police who killed our brothers and sisters in the local community. We know them. Look, those people killed. One is my brother's son. One is my child or my, my boy. That even when I was campaigning, as for, looking for the position of national national coordinator in the country, I told the whole country with him. And then this guy was, I can watch my head, I swear by Almighty Allah, that that guy is not a thief. He's not a robber. What is penny is? And then one of them also is my sister's uh, 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 mother's friend. You see? So what is it that you are saying? I can vouch that these people are not... That what is penny is in the Zongo community. You kill our brother. What is penny is? Seriously, is that they are saying that they are armed robbers. We are telling them that you've killed them. They've gone. We cannot do anything to bring them back. But that tag of being tagged as an armed robber is an erroneous expression that we want that thing to be moved away from that community. But how would you feel? For instance, if you are hitting the street, for instance, and the police that killed those seven people would be the same police uh, people to give you protection, how would you feel? Uh, and that's what we're saying. I mean, it's not possible. So it's not possible for them to go on demonstration. Because those people that we are, they are going to give you the protection are the same people that kill your people. Those people who kill our people, we know them. It's the police who kill our brothers and sisters. Or who kill our brothers there. 
is the police. And the one who killed the policeman, we don't know him. They themselves even cannot. They said they were wearing masks. And look how sure are they? These were the people who did who did that thing. And some people were saying that they were handcuffed. Some people were saying they saw them on their couple before they were shot. I mean, there are a lot of questions that need to be asked. There are a lot of questions that we need everybody to come to our aid. It's one money. I mean, the Zongo people are dying so many. We don't have any place apart from Zongo. Even only if you know you are a Zongo person. This is the place, and some of us have vowed to make a a better place. We want people to come and live with us. And we make a like a, 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 what you call it, abroad. So that when you come and live, you feel comfortable. And that's what some of us are about. And then inshallah, we'll do that. But if you are killing our people like this, they will come and do so many things. Well, Kam is said to have returned to the area now. Now, the Commonwealth uh, Human Rights Initiative, CHI Accra, Africa, Office, uh, meanwhile, says it is appalled at the news of the killing of seven suspected armed robbers by officers of the Ghana Police Service at Mansung Kwantania Kumase on Tuesday. The Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative believes the incident brings to the fore the urgent need for an independent body to investigate the police when uh, such infractions uh, take place. Let's speak with uh, Oheming Tia right now to bring us the very latest on the situation there. Hello, Oheming. So Hello. we're learning that there is relative calm. Can you still report that indeed the place is calm now? Hello? Yes, Oheming, I'm saying yes, I'm that we're, we're hearing that there's relative calm in the area. Can you indeed confirm that that is the situation right now as we speak? Hello, Israel. Can you come again with a question? All right. What can you tell us from where you are right now? Thank you, Israel. I'm currently on the streets of uh, Asmasi, and uh, there's peace here. Uh, police, uh, military team uh, have been patrolling the streets of Asmasi. Uh, we are back to exactly where they used in the morning after uh, the acting Saiki uh, Zongo and the leadership of the Zongo chief have addressed them uh, fall onto the street, uh, and then bang ties on the street. Uh, but now the, the streets are empty, and everybody that you see here is either on his way to somewhere or doing something else. And I, I've also been speaking to uh, the General Secretary of the National Association of Zongo Chiefs uh, for their reaction as far as uh, the conduct of the youth uh, is concerned, and they have condemned uh, what the youth uh, did uh, this morning, distancing uh, the uh, traditional, uh, the leadership uh, from uh, what uh, transpired uh, here in Aswansi uh, this morning. That led to the attack and the injuries on some police officers uh, here uh, in Aswansi. So Israel, I would say uh, the peace here and everybody is going about uh, his duties without a fear. All right, but do we know if any arrests at all have been made? Yes, I do know, because in the afternoon, uh, in my presence, the police uh, picked the four people up. Uh, these four people, uh, I was told, uh, are suspects uh, in attempts uh, to fulfill, uh, uh, to, to burn the Aswansi uh, police station down. Uh, it took the swift intervention of some mechanics. Of Well, it appears we have lost the line there to Oheming Teria uh, Arasawase in uh, Kumasi. But let's speak now to the Executive Director of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, Mina Mensah, who joins us via Skype. Uh, thank you for making time. Now, you're making some proposals to the IGP. First of all, you're saying that you don't think that the police should be investigating themselves. Please explain. Yes, and um, thank you very much, Israel. Good evening to you and viewers and listeners. You see, this is an incident where police is alleged to have gunned down people who are suspected to be robbers. All of them are dead. After the incident, the police moved the body from where the incident happened to the hospital. So, all the story that we have is just only the police words. So you're asking the police to investigate themselves. There is no way. There is nothing. The crime scene or this of the incident itself has been tampered with because the bodies have moved from there. Even if the police come out 
with a report. That is actually what happened. Honestly, as far as I'm concerned, people will not believe them. Neither would I. Why am I saying so? There's been several instances where the police have said that people are robbers. Then it turns out not to a case in point 2013, the police turned down their own and saying that they thought they were armed robbers. That is why they turned them down. So for me, it could be a case of mistaken identity. It could be true that they are robbers. Now, the community is also saying that we know these people. They are not robbers. In fact, some of them are the, the community they are even known to the police. So if you ask somebody to be a, ju a judge and a jury in his own case, how do you expect the rest of us who, uh, who are outside the police service, especially when there have been occasions where the police have investigated it and the findings have not been made public? There are several instances around. about this and uh, which body would you say should investigate the police? I think should fact over the police. I think that Ghana has an independent body. In the interim, all we have is to be. We are saying that the police should do this investigation. Number two, there should be a process after the investigations that should be made public for every the process they went through to arrive at the decision that, that that is very important because right from the onset it is agitating look at have done i do not believe that uh, resorting to is the right way to go wrong never in the good thing, resolve another wrong. So I appeal to the youth. There are processes in no matter how uh, difficult the situation. We live in a country of those are supposed to work. They exercise some patience and the time support to do good investigations and come out saying that we want all of us. But the police don't investigate itself, especially when a uh, uh, has come to defend his men. What he will do? They are. So, how would, if your relative was those people, how are you going to feel about it? Police's own image for the credibility of the. I think that the police should not be investigating itself alone, but there should be a collaboration. All right. Or better still, your interior can set up that. It is done all the time. Just talking about seven lives. Hello. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mina Mensa. Mina, Mina Mensa is with the uh, Commonwealth Human Rights uh, Initiative. A 25-year-old woman has been killed in the Ope, Kaswa Ope Kuma suburb after suspected robbers struck the community Wednesday afternoon. The body of the victim was then abandoned after it was covered with garbage and a dustbin. Residents who discovered the body say that they suspect the victim was raped as she had been stripped naked. Maxwell Wagba was there in our report. A woman is crying on the compound of the deceased. She's inconsolable as other family members try to hide their grief. Uncontrollable tears at the residence of the deceased Ama Kwansoma. Well, this is a shop and it remains closed. On a regular day, the 25-year-old uh, will be here managing um, this place. But today, she's no more. 
as the family continues to mourn her sudden departure. 25-year-old Ama Kwansuma had left home to go clean a house about 300 meters away from where her family lives. That routine was to be her last as some robbers who stormed her employer's home later that afternoon bolted with properties and murdered her in cold blood. Ames' brother Joseph Dugan believes the perpetrators are people who live in the neighborhood. He says the robbers killed her sister because she had identified them. He has been telling me how he discovered her sister naked with her arms and neck broken. <laughs> We were calling her phone since 12 p.m., but there was no response. She did not tell us where she'd be going. I left home around 4 p.m. to go and play with my friends. Apparently, she had gone to clean a house some meters away, and that was when the robbers came to the place. I'm sure they killed her because she would have been able to identify them. I saw her body outside the building. They broke her neck and her arms. This place has become a haven for criminals, and we are being terrorized. A lot of the um, residents I've been speaking to are raising concerns about the security situation here at Kasua Opekuma. The assemblyman for the area, Nanayawa Moafu, says something needs to be done urgently. Well, as we went there, the lady is naked, the, the panties is off, left with the up, uh, the attar, that is at the up. And uh, they've ripped her with the panties, as the panties have been removed, they've ripped her and they went inside the room and they robbed them too. So what did they take from the house? Oh, so many things, they took so many things. Television, so many things. We cannot even not, uh, count it. Well, our security over here is very poor because uh, at times, a lot of people have heard so many things about Opekuma, Opekuma. Uh, we have people that have been snatching. Uh, I don't, if the women are going to market, they have been snatching their bags. Brother of the deceased says after a four hour fruitless search for his sister, the later um, discovered the body lying here with this dustbin on it. This rubbish gathered here was used um, to conceal the body. Well, a 37-year-old Mason is in the grips of the police for killing and dumping his ex-girlfriend in a bush at Gumwa in Kwantanang in the central region. Police discovered the decomposing body Thursday afternoon after two days of search. Maxwell Bagba, who was working on another crime story in the, area, in the region, uh, chanced on the incident. It is Thursday afternoon. We are in an isolated community at Gomuang Kwantanan in the central region. We are here in the company of some police officers going deep into the bush where the 37 year old allegedly dumped the body of his former girlfriend. A woman is standing close to a mini truck ready to convey the body to the morgue. She spews words intended to invoke the spirit of the victim to deal with her killers. We are currently in the middle of nowhere here at Gomwa in Kwantanan in the um, central region. Police officers here are getting ready to convey the body to the morgue. But before that, um, they had to spray the decomposing um, body before um, they were able um, to carry it. I've been speaking to the station officer for a Wutu break. He has been narrating to me exactly what happened. That was three days ago that Omar came to the police station and reported a missing of his girlfriend, uh, Mary Tete. So while looking for her, yesterday we had information that uh, one as a bunny, the former boyfriend, he was the one who murdered the, the girlfriend. So this morning, we had me arrested yesterday, and this morning we came to the scene, combed the whole area, and now that we got the body in the bush. So we are now about to convey the body to the mortuary. 
Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. So what, what's going to happen after the body has been converted to the world? Has he, has he, he confessed to the crime? Oh, he confessed. He confessed really. He confessed that you are the one who made the And mm -hmm. carried it from the house to the nearby bush. Keep the body? Yes, there. he carried it by, his, by himself and then dumped it in the nearby bush. So this man, when he came, it was a very uh, hard for us to locate the body because he refused to even show us where the body was deposited. But we tried, 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 and then by the grace of God, he was able, finally able to show us where the body is. So we are here with the body now, yes, to convey to the mortuary. Yeah. Okay. The deceased new boyfriend is standing some meters away from the body as his rival, who is the main suspect, is in handcuffs. He told me he saw blood stains on the compound the day the incident happened. He later reported to the police that his girlfriend had gone missing. Find her around, and they said some guy come around and look for her. Was looking for the girl. So once I follow through investigation, I know that this guy he come to my area looking for this girl. Hmm. So did you know he had any intentions? Of yes, yes, yes. Around last last week Thursday, hmm. he traced the girl. When the girl from somewhere, she from. Where she going? Where she's going to church? She was from there coming, and this guy crossed her on the road, want to struggle with her. So she finds someone. Someone is coming. So she she went to sleep at the person's place. So next day I went to meet her. Then we come out, and mm. she explained to me that this guy is, is after her. The accused bolted after allegedly committing the crime, but later confided in a friend. The friend, under the guise of helping him conceal the crime lured the suspect and alerted the police who caused his arrest. Reporting for Joy News, Maxwell Agbaba. The state's quest to retrieve some 51.2 million CDs from businessman Alfred Woyome is now in limbo as UT Bank and one Abna Achia are both claiming ownership of his properties the state intends to sell. The Supreme Court Thursday fixed October 15 to hear arguments from all persons claiming ownership of the properties. Deputy Attorney General Gofrid Yabwa Dame says the ownership claims is a conspiracy to frustrate efforts to retrieve the money. There is more in the following report by Joseph Akabling. Comprise one residential facility at Trazaku, another at Tesano, both in Accra, and a business Mr. Woyeme owns in the Volta region. Deputy Attorney General Godfrey Yabu Adami on Thursday asked Soul Judge Justice Alfred Benin to determine one of two matters before it. Order Mr. Woyeme to return to the witness box for his oral examination to continue or to determine the dispute over Woyeme's properties. The oral examination, which commenced months back, is aimed at helping the state to identify Mr. Woyeme's assets. Lawyers for the businessman, led by Petrina Defia, asked that the court halt the proceedings due to to pending cases involving government and the businessman at various international courts. Justice Benin turned down the request, saying the external courts can only order the government and not the Supreme Court. Lawyers for the defunct UT Bank urged the sole judge to address their claims to the property instead of dealing with the oral examination. Lawyers for Abna Echian, led by Opoku and Ponsa, also told the court they own the residential facility in contention. They said they had only rented it out to Mr. Woyeme for a period which has long Elapsed. Deputy AG Godfrey Yabu Adami, however, disputed the claims made by Mrs. Echian, saying the state had reason to believe some form of collision is taking place to prevent its retrieval of the funds. Justice Benny ruled that it was important for the court to deal with the claims concerning the properties. He ordered UT Bank and Mrs. Abner Echian to file evidence of ownership by August 31. The AG's office is to file evidence challenging the claims by October 5, 2018. The court intends to hear oral arguments on October 15. President Kufado, as part of his tour of the Upper East Reading, has inspected the ongoing construction of a dam at Hanyopia community in the Bongo district. The construction began last month after the Bongo district chief executive handed over sites for the implementation of the One Village, One Dam policy. Addressing a devil of the chiefs and people of Bongo, President Kufado assured that the policy has come to stay, promising the Bongo district 10 more dams this year. We have begun the One Village, One Dam initiative, and you here in Bogo can see for yourself that we have begun the initiative. It is our intention that Bongo alone will get 10 
dance this year. 570 are being built. You heard the minister across the three northern regions. A Bongo constituency alone is going to get 10 out of that 560, 570. When we came, we said that there were many things that we had promised the people of Ghana that we would do. At the time, we were making those commitments. Our opponents said that I was lying to the people of Ghana. The things that I said I wanted to do, I couldn't do it. And that I was only saying them to get votes. Well, we're one and a half years later Free secondary high school education in Ghana is today a reality for the people of Ghana. Last year, it meant that 90,000 more students entered secondary school than the year before. This year, the number is doubling. It will be 180,000 more students are coming into the secondary school system than have become before. So we are fulfilling our promise. And we're making it clear that senior high school education as free is here to stay in Ghana forever and ever. Well, correspondent Albert Story joins me by Skype for more on the president's tour in the region. Now, what more activities, uh, Albert, has the president been has the president been engaged in? Yes. So the president also has sought for uh, the construction of a bridge. Um, there is a broken down bridge which uh, is on the road from uh, Bongo to Bongo Balu. Now that bridge was constructed about four years ago, but um, the road is completely cut off. So what happens is that when you have people traveling between the two towns, they have to go down to the river and cross. So if it happens to rain, but it means that people cannot cross uh, between Bongo and Bobal. So uh, they made this note to the press, and he cut short for the construction of the road and uh, for them to fix that bridge as well. And in fact, he promised them that it's not just something he's doing for the purpose of campaigning, but next year, by this time, if he visits uh, Bongo, will come and commission uh, that bridge. All right, thank you very much, uh, Correspondent Albert Sorry. Residents of Medina are raising concerns of uh, abandoned footbridges on the highway running through the populous Accra suburb. The residents are worried the absence of a functional footbridge puts the lives of road users and pedestrians at risk. They want the Ghana Highway Authority and other relevant bodies to ensure the footbridges abandoned some six years ago are completed. Join us as Eunice Carl visited the road and asked more in the following report. Residents and pedestrians around Medina Firestone and its environs risk being knocked down by speeding vehicles as they cross from one end of the road to the other to conduct their business. What would have aided their movement with minimal or no risk of being knocked down by vehicles are these footbridges. About six footbridges from Medina Firestone to Adenta Barrier Highway have been left uncompleted for more than six years. The dual carriageway, also known as the N4, links Tetekwashi Interchange, Adenta, Ibri, and is usually very busy. The absence of footbridges is not the only concern raised by people around this area. The speed of accidents on the stretch is also high. Those who spoke to Joy News recount more than five road accidents are recorded in this area weekly. So many times. A motor even wanted to kill me last time. If I was not uh, careful, I should have been in a motor right now. About three, three days. So we are pulling for the government to finish this thing so that it will be free. We are going to school early morning. There was a young lady lying down. A car knocked her down. Like, hey, 
I think her head was smashed or something, smashed up or something like that. Yeah, on two several occasions. Yeah, even me myself, I was crossing this road one, one I think some time ago, and a car was trying to knock me down. My agent to come and complete it so that like it would be it would be more safer using the footbridge than crossing the road and um, like increasing the accident. Because the road is a dual carriageway, sometimes crossing it becomes difficult. Most of the times it takes 10 minutes to even cross the road. We are pleading with the government to complete the foot bridges for us. Drivers say they are equally worried about the efforts they have to put in to ensure they don't knock down pedestrians. This place, if uh, uh, the light is green, so people are crossing. So uh, if you are getting here, you have to take time. Maybe somebody can just cross cross you at any time. So if you don't take time, we just hit the person. And have you experienced any accidents? Oh, many of them. Many of them. At times, it might be a motorbike. If a motorbike is crossing, the person will never check that uh, the, the light is green or whatever, then you, you just cross. And that one, if you don't take time, you knock him. Normally, you have to, because pedestrians are part of this thing. But if we have this one, we wouldn't have people you know, crossing for you to even slow down you know, for them to. So I'm appealing. It is better. It's too long for this thing to be there, uncompleted. Past people will be crossing and then car hitting them, some dying, some, you know, being hospitalized for so many days. Yeah. So I'm appealing to the government to take note of that one and then try to complete it. The municipal chief executive of La Nkwantanan, Jennifer Dede Afagbeji, says reports of motor accidents and pedestrian knockdowns is frequent. She appeals to the Ghana Highway Authority to complete the abandoned project as soon as possible. Um, activities and movements of people are very rampant in uh, the, this specific, specific areas and the food bridge is not completed. Is a, is a worry to us. A number of times it's come up in our music meetings where uh, some statistics have been given regarding the, the number of uh, casualties and even fatalities that we experience or we've witnessed on the main highway because of the uncompleted food bridges. Uh, last year when I came in, we made some, um, we, we wrote to highways, we did some follow-ups as well regarding the timelines for completion of the footbridges so that uh, we within Lankwantanan Medina can at least cross the road safely. Uh, we, we were told it's and then the project, the contractor would come back to site. We are yet to see that, although we have confidence in the fact that it will be completed, we would wish that um, some speed was put into it for us because we, we, we are worried about the number of um, fatalities that we are recording. And so we wouldn't want it to go beyond what we have already uh, witnessed. So uh, this would be an appeal uh, and a platform for me to appeal once again. Uh, we, we've done this over and over. We, we, we have made appeals both on radio, on TV stations and all that. Delay in completing the footbridges and fixing of some defective traffic lights in the area remain a key challenge to reducing road clashes in the area. Jonas Carl, a footage report for Joy News. Great, but uh, before we actually get on, we have uh, this uh, press statement coming from the Deputy Majority Leader, Member of Parliament for Dome Kwabenya. It has to do with uh, some sponsorship letter she wrote to the NHIA, which we covered in the news yesterday. And so we have this letter, which we are going to be sharing. It says, uh, I did not receive any payment from NHIA. And uh, this we got to clarify from the spokesperson uh, yesterday. But 
I'll just read a bit of it. It says, the attention of the Office of the Deputy Majority Leader and Member of Parliament for Dom Kwabenya, Honorable Sarah Adrasaf, who has been drawn to a leaked document purported to have emanated from the Office of the National Health Insurance Authority. In the said document, which has since gone viral on social, various social media platforms, including the mainstream media, Honorable Sarah Adrasafo is said to have requested for a sponsorship of uh, 8,500 US dollars from the NHI to enable her and the ticket training session in the Women and Power Executive Program at the Harvard Kennedy School in the United States of America. We wish to state as follows that yes, the Honorable Sarah Adrasafo made the said request for sponsorship to the NHI in the letter dated March 16, 2018 that the request was subsequently withdrawn by a letter dated 21st May 2018 due to Parliament's decision to foot the entire cost of the training, which includes the cost of her tickets and accommodation. Now, the NHI, in responding to the withdrawal letter of Honorable Sarah Adrasa for dated 5th July 2018, confirmed that NHI did not make any payment whatsoever to Honorable Sarah Adrasa for that the Parliament of Ghana sponsored her to pursue the said leadership program in Parliament's resolve to sponsor the training session was born out of the fact that the office she occupies in the legislature as chairperson of the Women's Caucus is a critical one, that there are no records to show that she did not receive any money, that there are records rather to show that she did not receive any money from the NHIA as the Parliament agreed to sponsor the educational program. It must therefore be stated that Honorable Sarah Jassafu did not receive any money from NHIA nor did she authorize any person to do so. All documents that support this claim have been attached to this statement. And indeed, uh, the documents were attached, and uh, we have them shared on our social, various social media platforms. All right, and in the headlines, Ghanaians have been spared the dreaded increase in the VAT rate speculated ahead of the 2018 mid-year budget review. That, however, translates into consumers paying more, as acknowledged by Deputy Finance Minister Kweku Kwating. Would be also, that a cons also, those who earn 10,000 CDs and above will have to give up 35% of it in taxes. Well, not 35% of 10,000 CDs, actually, as we have been made to understand. And then there's also some good news for prospective homeowners who can use part of the pension contributions to secure themselves a mortgage. Police military team intervened to restore relative calm to Kumasi suburb where angry youth went on rampage over the killing of seven members of the community. And that's it for the bulletin. My name is Ujelai. Have a good night. is Joy News Prime.